welcome again to the conference 30 years of capitalist transformation in Central and Eastern Europe. My name is Veronica Lazar and I teach history of political thought at the University of Bucharest and I'm also a member of the Institute for Social Solidarity. And it is my great pleasure to welcome here tonight Professor Kostas Lapavitas, one of our keynote speakers. Uh, Kostas Lapavitas lives and works in London, teaches economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and is a former member of, in the Greek Parliament. And as many of you know very well, has done research on, among other things, uh, the political economy of money and finance, Marxist monetary theory, the financialization of capitalism and its manifold consequences on our contemporary society, the theory of financial capital, uh, Japanese economy, history of economic thought, economic history, and others. And uh, most of all, in the last decade or so, uh, his research interests focused mo mostly on the Eurozone crisis, and he questions the pot potential of the EU and the uh, public financial institutions for being reformed efficiently, at least from a left-wing or socialist point of view, and with socialist solutions. And Kostas Lapavitsas is not only a renowned academic, but he also writes regularly for the international and the Greek press. He has been engaged in very influential scientific debates as well as in political struggles. And tonight our discussion, discussant will be Cornel Bahn, Cornell is an associate professor of international political economy at Copenhagen Business School. He will open the, the discussion, the debate, with some comments of his own. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for discussion. And I suggest you to raise your hands uh, to make me a sign in the chat box so I will know when you want to, uh, to ask your questions. After that, I think the recordings will be available online. Uh, I think they will be recorded via YouTube. So if your internet connection is, uh, is not very liable, it's a little bit capricious, we have also this second best option, okay? Um, thank you. And on this note, Costas, please let me hand it to you. Thank you very much, Veronica. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, it is conventional to say that it's a great pleasure to take part in a conference. And uh, obviously I would say that, but this time I mean it. It is a great pleasure to take part in this conference because of its importance and magnitude, because it is in Romania and Transylvania more specifically and closer to where I come from. And because it's um, associated with Karl Polanyi, of course. Um, whom I've always taken very seriously in my own work and from whom I've learned um, a great deal. And Polanyi's relevance um, to today is uh, greater than ever. Uh, in a sense, it is arguable that there is another great transformation going on um, or the beginnings thereof. And we need to um, think carefully about it. And uh, part of what I'm gonna talk about today relates to that. Not directly, but indirectly for sure. Um, let me tell you what I plan to do. It's, um, it's quite an ambitious thing. I was asked to be ambitious. In fact, I was told to be ambitious by the organizers and I, um, I will oblige. Um, I will talk about sub sub subordinate financialization. Um, what it is and what it means for uh, developing countries, in my own view, and specifically for Eastern Europe. I will talk about um, the broader context in the first place, and then I will focus it um, as much as I can to Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is not my area of specialization, but I've done a fair amount uh, of subordinate financialization in Europe, so I'll be able to uh, provide some, um, some context, I think. So I'll do that. Once I've done that, I'll then shift to discussing the impact of the pandemic, because I think the, um, the pandemic crisis is of great importance and it will affect developing countries and developed countries. It will also affect Eastern and Central Europe in crucial ways. And I want to discuss how that is. I want to begin to get a sense uh, 
of what is happening uh, right in front of us. And I'll do that from the perspective of um, radical political economy, or to be precise, from the perspective of Marxist political economy. I've never hidden that this is what I use mostly. So um, this is what I understand by it, um, as you will see in a minute. So let's start without uh, any further um, ado, and let's try and make this work. What is subordinate financialized capitalism? There's a literature on this that has emerged uh, in bits and pieces the last um, 10, 15 years, and it's become very substantial the last two or three years. You can find a debate between those who think in terms of subordinate financialized capitalism, subordinate financialization, and those who think in terms of, say, dependent financialization. I'm not going to consider the literature because I haven't got the time, but I've learned a lot from it. And much of it, the most interesting stuff tends to be French regulationist in origin. But here I will tell you what I think it is um, from the perspective that I've been developing together with my um, colleagues. And um, Subordinate financialization in this context is basically a derivative process, um, derivative to financialization at the core of the system. Um, in other words, it's not a process that has begun spontaneously. It's a process that has come to a certain extent from the outside. Uh, it's based on um, uh, free capital flows. They're very, very important. In other words, financial globalization uh, is fundamental to it. Reserve accumulation uh, and foreign bank entry. Um, this system of relationships emerging globally is of course integrally related to world money. Or to put it differently in more contemporary terms to the global currency hierarchy. Currencies matter and currencies are not the same. All countries have got currencies but currencies were not created equal. So there is a, there's a pyramid, the dollar sits at the top, that is quasi world money. It's the form that world money takes, takes today, the world reserve currency, other currencies um, are distinctly um, uh, secondary. And subordinate financialization is, is integrally related to this, to, 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 to currency hierarchy. Second point about it, um, subordinate financialization has to do with the activities of large corporates, domestic corporates, and these borrow from abroad, but also uh, use domestic markets um, for activity and for borrowing. And so subordinate capitalism, financialized capitalism has to do with the activities of these corporations, uh, which constantly mix markets and banks, borrowing from banks and borrowing from open markets. They don't do that because they've started doing it independently. They do it partly because of the first reason, which is the internationalization of capital flows. In other words, countries are encouraged or often forced to in internationalize capital flows, and then domestic corporations begin to take part uh, in this game, and then their activities change uh, as a result. That's a big contrast with the core countries where financialization is associated with the activities of corporates autonomously, endogenously, as it were. And the third point that I want to stress here is that households in developing countries, or emerging markets, as they're often called, and I will call them that myself, are dra dragged into this uh, process. They are drawn into um, this um, financial system for consumption, for housing, and for pensions. In other words, on both sides of the balance sheet, of a household. In other words, the assets, which is the pensions, but also the liabilities, which is the debts that households accumulate uh, to buy a house or to consume. Um, that, in a sense, is the most remarkable novel phenomenon, the increasing implication of households uh, in developing countries in this. Uh, and that is also derivative of the entry of foreign banks and the opening of um, domestic economy to global capital flows. These elements are fairly clear and I've developed them in my work, so I have others. I will use them as we move along. What's less clear, and I'll just mention it here, 
so that you bear it in mind, is that the connection between this kind of internationalization of relations, whereby core countries are connected to peripheral countries through these flows of finance, the connection between, this is, between these flows of finance and the globalization of production is not clear. That is the, uh, one of the most interesting open questions uh, for political economy, but also for economics today. In other words, is the globalization of finance a necessary outcome or a precondition of the globalization of production? Is the spreading of production uh, capabilities across the world um, of the same order, as it were, as the globalization of finance? Um, what does it cause it? That we don't have a good answer for, and that matters. Uh, and uh, I will tell you more as we move along. The other point I want to, the other points I want to stress now as we move along is that this system of subordinate financialization into which of course, Central and Eastern Europe have also been drawn is state reliant and unstable. Um, it has given rise to new forms of exploitation, um, exploitation through finance, Financial expropriation is what I like to call it in my own work. In other words, a direct shift of value from the borrower to the lender, a direct transfer. It's also given uh, rise to uh, new alliances between industrial and financial capital, domestically and internationally, new forms of surplus extraction from periphery to core based on um, capital flows and the role of the dollar globally. In the case of Europe, the role of the Euro, which I will explain as we move along. It's a system that rests on the state. Very, very important to stress that, though in the context of the pandemic, anyone who's got doubts about it needs to rethink the world, um, as I will stress in a minute. But it's a system based on the state. The state creates financial, rather, the state backs financialization, makes financialization possible, um, the state defends it, the state deepens it, and the state does so while using neoliberalism as its ideology and policy framework. It's a contradiction, a deep contradiction with profound implications, which I will develop uh, when we discuss the pandemic crisis. The last thing I want to mention uh, in this context is that, um, as I've already indicated, um, Subordinate financialization is the contemporary way of understanding global hegemony, I think, and core periphery divisions. That's basically, that's basically what it means uh, for me. Uh, uh, core periphery divisions globally, core periphery divisions in a peculiar way in, Euro in Europe, hegemony globally, and hegemony in a peculiar uh, way in Europe. Um, and it is to this that I want um, for this, to th in this respect, I want to give you some further insight. But to do that, let's have a look more closely at capital flows. Capital flows matter internationally and matter for Eastern Europe. In other words, the, the internationalization of uh, loanable money capital uh, transactions, the opening of borders for finance. Um, how should we think about it? The crucial aspect here is that these flows, as I say, into which Eastern and Central Europe have been drawn, uh, are basically aimed at portfolio diversification. One should never lose sight of that. That this is not development finance. There is a world of difference between development finance and portfolio diversification finance. So, so the. The, the flows that we're talking about, which catalyze subordinate financialization, are, are very distinctly portfolio, di portfolio diversification flows. Um, in other words, the push factors and the pull factors that are behind these flows are driven by portfolio considerations, risk return uh, considerations, not development considerations. Um, and as a result, these international capital flows into emerging markets into developing countries are dominated by um, high frequency uh, and short-term transactions. And they have surges, they have sudden stops, they have flights, they have retrenchments. Um, 
uh, because of course, the third point here, the lenders always engage in arbitrage. The lenders make these decisions by choosing between risk-free and liquid assets on the one hand versus high return and high risk assets. That choice is of crucial importance for developing countries. And we saw it as I will give you evidence for uh, in the pandemic. That's precisely what portfolio finance is all about. Um, therefore, the key factor for understanding portfolio, for, for understanding global capital flows and therefore financialization, subordinate financialization is sovereign spreads, the difference between interest rates, um, pivoting on the US dollar. That's how currency hierarchy manifests itself. Um, the, 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 the lenders, um, the um, uh, active agents here make choices by looking at what ha what ha what's happening in US monetary policy, what's happening to US assets or other core country assets and decide uh, in relation to emerging country uh, assets. In extreme cases, you get the so-called carry trade, in other words, speculative transactions emanating from the developing countries themselves, um, taking part in these flows for short-term profits with inevitable um, uh, conclusions to which I will come in a minute. This system then has had two phases. And the real question is whether we're going into a third phase right now. The first phase, we can say starts from 2003 and lasts until the great financial crisis of 2008. That's really when subordinate financialization comes on stream. That's after the great Asian crisis of 1997, 2001, finishing with the Turkish crisis of 2001. Um, the first phase begins uh, of these flows, which catalyze subordinate financialization in, in, in the developing world. Um, these flows and th that phase uh, were, were dominated by banks. Banks were the main agent. Banks acted as the main supplier of funds, and that you found across Eastern and Central Europe at the time, mostly Austrian banks, German banks, French banks to a certain extent. They acted as the main provider of loans. They were the main pivot of financialization during that time. And they were, they were crucial to transmitting financial conditions across borders. They, they took the risk on their balance sheets uh, because they were the main lending agent. After the great financial crisis, from about 2010 onwards, this changes. Banks are no longer the main agent. In fact, banks are no longer the main agent of financialization in the core countries too, as I will explain in a minute. What happens after that is that capital markets uh, become uh, the key terrain for subordinate uh, financialization. Capital markets, including basically bo bo both bonds and equity, and private investors begin to be the main lender. And that means hedge funds or some variant of fund, equity funds, some, some variant uh, of, of, of funds, not banks. Often they draw on banks for credit, but they are the manager of huge amounts of money and make decisions themselves. Uh, and they make the portfolio decisions and they reach for yield. In other words, they seek profit and they seek profit in the portfolio way that I explained a few minutes ago. That's basically what drives these flows. And that was, that's been characteristic for more than, uh, of, of, of global, global capitalism for more, than, for more than a decade. And I will show you what happened during the pandemic uh, as a result of that. The real question is, will this change? I will leave you with some speculations on this. Um, now, the impact of this on uh, developing countries is not difficult to see, and the impact of this on Eastern Europe is not difficult to see, although there's great vari variation in Eastern Europe as well, so I'm generalizing. <clears throat> if you read what the defenders of this kind of approach have to say, for example, the BIS, uh, and a whole host of um, basically neoliberal uh, economics departments and neoliberal academics in core countries, but also in developing countries, this process is a good thing. It's a good thing. Financial globalization, or more accurately, global financialization, is a good thing. It's a good thing because presumably it will lead to higher growth and uh, higher investment and higher growth in developing countries. It will encourage them to acquire good institutions, good from the perspective of um, portfolio finance, as I've explained already. 
and it will encourage them to, um, to have market-induced discipline in policy. In other words, it will encourage developing countries to follow the dictates of the bond markets. The bond markets are the main arbiter of good policy in this context. And if you diverge from the bond market, the bond market will punish you. Um, so that's basically what the logic is um, of these uh, official orthodox argumentations. <clears throat> in practice, what we see is of course not that, but we don't see good development outcomes. It's not the case. We don't see measurable, strong, po strongly positive uh, growth benefits for developing countries um, from adopting this um, approach. Um, and certainly not particularly in Eastern Europe from that, although there are differences which I will explain in a minute. What we see rather is pro-cyclical capital flows. In other words, flows that intensify uh, booms and busts uh, driven by global financial liquidity cycles. In other words, whatever happens in the monetary policy of core countries, above all the United States, dictates what happens to global capital flows. That is very, very true for the pandemic crisis, as I will show you in a minute. Um, so that's really the driving mechanism. It's a, there's a global financial cycle as a result of this process, driven by the decisions of the monetary authorities in the core countries. That's the nature of hierarchy. That's how it appears. That's the, that, that is how core and periphery appears. You know, it's not, a, it's not a, the core is not the core for nothing. Uh, and the way, the way in which its um, dominance appears today is in, the, in this regard too. For developing countries, this means of course, loss of autonomy in fiscal and monetary policy. That is the nature of being subordinate, uh, autonomy is lost. You have to comply with whatever um, the policy of core countries dictates for you. In this context, and especially in view of the pandemic, for which I repeat, I will show you evidence in a minute, seems to me that those who want to see a different system and a system that truly has the, um, the interests of people in developing countries, including Eastern Europe and Central Europe in mind, should be argued for capital controls. Uh, that system of free capital flows and subordinate financialization is not the system that um, promotes the um, well-being, uh, income, and employment of um, developing countries. Let me give you a little bit more context now, after this general introduction about Europe. That's the general formulation that I always use when I approach uh, global financialization. Europe, however, is different. Uh, it is very much part of the same um, specification, but it is also different. And the key reason for the difference is the monetary union. This process in Europe has been conditioned by the monetary union, um, which is um, extraordinarily important because it dictates the terms through which currency hierarchy works. Currency hierarchy has been negated within Europe, much of Europe, through the EMU. There are several countries which, of course, are not part of the Euro, and so currency hierarchy reappears there. But uh, for many, many countries, 19 actually, several of which are in Eastern Europe, quite why they joined, I still don't know, but there you are. Um, for for uh, quite a lot of these countries, currency hierarchy has been eliminated because of the euro. That is how hegemony appears now. In the context of the global system, hegemony appears more directly in terms of the US dollar and the dominant position of the US central bank with the implications that I broadly sketched for you. In Europe, that's not how it appears. Hegemony is actually a German thing. And it appears through the institutions of the monetary union, therefore the institutions of the European Union and the policies of the European Central Bank. And it is this that I want to give you some insight into, particularly in the context of the pandemic, because it's, it's changed uh, substantially. So um, in Europe, then it works in this way. German hegemony pivoting on the EMU. Um, the reason why Germany and German industry has succeeded in doing that is, of course, 
a sustained competitive advantage by ensuring for itself a low real effective exchange rate through the EMU. If it wasn't for the Euro, um, the exchange rate of the German state, the Deutsche Mark, would have been very, very different today. Uh, and that would have had a, a negative impact on German industry. Certainly Germany would not have been able to have the enormous structural current account surplus that he has, the biggest in the world. I mean, proportionately, Germany is, Germany is basically a country that sucks in aggregate demand from across the world. This is absurd, the way uh, it works. The counterpart to that is that, of course, Germany exports capital, and it exports quite a bit of capital to Eastern Europe, and to Eastern Europe it exports also capital directly. That's the peculiarity of it, and that's how hege hegemony uh, is conditioned in Europe. That's how financial um, subordination uh, appears in Eastern Europe, partly associated with FDI. The creation of peripheries then, to which I alluded in the general discussion, the core and periphery distinction globally in Europe uh, is more variegated. When we look at Europe today, we can see at least two peripheries, mostly through the operations of the monetary union, and partly through the direct action of German capital uh, and its FDI. So within the monetary union, there is a Southern periphery that doesn't contain Eastern Europe. The Southern periphery is basically um, Spain, Portugal, um, Greece, and half of Italy. These countries um, basically have got weak industry, a large public sector that cannot act as, a, uh, as, as an employer of last resort. And they're basically suppliers of, um, uh, of trained skilled workers to core countries, the hegemonic countries, primarily Germany. The other periphery, which contains Eastern and um, Central European countries, and the, and the periphery I've got in mind is basically Portugal, uh, basically Poland, Hungary, um, Slovakia, uh, Slovenia, and what was the other one? Um, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, Poland. Um, Anyway, the Czech Republic are five countries of which I've got in there. So I've just drawn a blank, which I've got in the, in the paper. Um, that periphery is very different to the southern periphery. That periphery is associated with the euro through subordinate financialization processes, the export of capital, but it is also associated with Germany through foreign direct investment. And that dictates how uh, subordinate financialization works um, in, in, in those countries, and it gives uh, content to how their economies function. Let me give you a little bit of evidence so that uh, you see the difference between those peripheries. Here we are uh, in terms of uh, nominal unit labor costs. I've used this before many times, and it is basically uh, an indication of Germany keeping its own wages low and therefore having a low exchange rate, effective exchange rate, because there is no adaptation of uh, currencies because the currencies have been eliminated within the monetary union. So Germany accumulates a, a, a competitive advantage by keeping wages and wage increases below other countries in the monetary union. The result is this. Here I've, I've drawn the southern periphery, which I mentioned, and the central European periphery, which I've also mentioned to you, and uh, France and Italy and Germany. This is the current account as proportion to GDP. You can see the enormous surplus that Germany makes. You can see that France and Italy are nowhere near in terms of ability to compete. Uh, you can also see the difference between the central periphery and the southern periphery um, of Europe. They are very different peripheries. So financial uh, subordination, subordinate financialization works differently in the south of Europe compared to um, uh, central Europe for the reasons that I pointed out. Here is a little bit more evidence. Here is industrial production in relation to itself. In other words, rates of growth starting from 100. You can see what happens in central, uh, the central European periphery. You can see that um, the industrial sector actually grows in many of these countries. Czech Republic and Poland are clear cases. Um, it doesn't grow in the southern periphery. 
these are, I repeat, these are not in relation to, to themselves. They're in relation to, to, to each other. They're in relation to themselves. So it just shows you that the Central European periphery is acquiring an industrial sector uh, associated with Germany, fundamentally. And that you can see in terms of German FDI. Um, German FDI has shifted away from the USA towards Europe. Much of it is directed through uh, Luxembourg and Netherlands. These are basically, these are basically money laundering centers in Europe. They might want to accuse others, but that's how Luxembourg works. And that's how much of the Netherlands works. And much of German FDI is passed through uh, Luxembourg and, and the Netherlands. Uh, nonetheless, you can see the shift away from the United States towards Europe, and you can see the difference between the central and the southern periphery. Uh, the proportion of German FDI going to the central periphery is much higher than the southern periphery uh, of Europe. So subordinate financialization works very differently in Eastern Europe compared to um, Southern Europe. And the last piece of evidence, however, which is important, you mustn't think, having spoken of some kind of difference in industrial output and industrial performance, that there's been some kind of some kind of investment miracle. That's not what I'm talking about. These are proportional things. Investment is actually quite weak in the central periphery too. It's not as if the system is actually making for dynamic growth um, in Eastern Europe. It's just better than the Southern periphery, right? And different to the Southern periphery. Now, having said all this, what can we say about the pandemic? which is really the meat of what I want to say. How are we to understand the pandemic shock in this context? What has it meant for subordinate financialization and in particular, Eastern Europe? What can we say about that? And what has it meant for core countries? Let me start at the outset by saying it's a point of inflection. I think it's a very important moment. It's a point of inflection for neoliberalism. I think the shock that we've been going through since the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, is not endogenous to capitalist accumulation. So in that respect, it's not a standard crisis, such as the great financial crisis, okay? So it's not endogenous to capitalist accumulation, but it has impacted capitalist accumulation greatly. Um, I also want to say, however, that the crisis is broadly endogenous to capitalist relations of public health, interaction with nature, and state power. So it is endogenous to capitalism, but not endogenous to capitalist accumulation, if I may use this expression. I think the distinction is very important um, for understanding how it, uh, how it works and what it would mean. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the aspects of public health and so on, because it will take us down a different path. What I only want to say here in relation to the third point that you see is that um, it could have been different. The, the management of the pandemic crisis could have been different. There is no doubt at all about it. It could have been done in a socially aware way, right? in a socially focused way. It wasn't. It was done in a way that exacerbated differences, exacerbated inequalities. It was done in a way that defended big interests. And in that way, it was indigenous to capitalist relations, um, as I will point out in a minute. Um, the last point I want to make here is that the pandemic crisis signals a far greater role for the state, and it will intensify the geopolitical struggle for hegemony, and it has transformed the nature of hegemony in Europe. That will affect Eastern Europe. And I want, to, uh, I want to draw out how that is. There is a transformation in Europe at the moment as a result of the pandemic crisis. Rather, there's a transformation that began at the, at the great financial crisis and the pandemic crisis has, conf has confirmed it, has actually solidified it. So let me, let me spend the, the remaining time I've got uh, discussing this. <laughs> Why and how? One, of course, must start with the last crisis. That's how it always is in capitalism, from one crisis to the next. And when you look at the great financial crisis, what followed it, let's not go into what caused it, 
But what followed it was, of course, a relative stagnation. Relative stagnation of core countries. What we saw was weak investment, weak productivity growth, weak profitability, and greater inequality. So let me, let me demonstrate this to you very quickly, including Europe and the United States. Here is Germany, France, UK, Japan, and the United States. This is investment. This is investment throughout the period of financialization, including the period since the great uh, financial crisis. You can see the dip of investment, which was the main cause of uh, poor economic performance. And you can see the weakness of investment afterwards. Um, we, the, the chief characteristic of financialization, weak investment has not gone away, right? And it marked the previous decade. You can also see uh, the same point in terms of productivity, productivity growth and the rate of productivity growth. You can see that the period of financialization has been characterized by weakly increasing productivity. That might come as a surprise to, to some of you or to many of you, because if you read the press, if you read the accounts of what's happening in the world, what you will see time and again is breathless breathless discussions of the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, the 25th industrial revolution, everything that's gonna happen in the world because of robots and because of communications and technology and so on. Maybe, possibly. I can tell you what's happening in the productivity of labor, however, as these new technologies are introduced. And that's not very impressive. The rate at which productivity increases is weak. And the weakest period has been since the great financial crisis. Appalling, appalling productivity increase. Why? Possibly to do with the nature of these technologies. We need good political economy to look into that rather than the standard econometrics of economists, right? Um, the new technology is not delivering for the moment. Um, and without productivity increase, capitalism doesn't function as it should do. Um, but in any case, for our purposes, the last decade has been a decade of very weak productivity growth, as you can see. Uh, from the evidence uh, I've shown you. And uh, if productivity growth is, in, is weak, of course, profitability will also be weak. Here is profit rates for the United States. And you can see what happens. The profit rate fluctuates throughout this period. And the profit rate just before the pandemic hit uh, was weak. This was a weak economy, in other words, around about 2019. Weak, it might have been, but it was also more unequal. This is the functional distribution of income. In other words, the splitting of um, production between capital and labor. And of course, capital, again, increased its share. Inequality increased. The functional distribution of labor, of income, moved even more in favor of um, capital. In other words, what have we got? We've got a system throughout the last decade, which is not growing fast, not increasing productivity fast, uh, its profitability is fairly weak from suppressing labor and therefore it's increasing inequality. That's financialized capitalism in the core countries. Quite why was it like that though? I don't wanna go into the details of it, but one factor that was very important was of course austerity in the, in the West, in developed countries. Austerity, the suppression of aggregate demand. In other words, when the great financial crisis happened, the state intervened to rescue the system. In monetary policy, it adopted um, a very expansionary policy, as I will show you in more detail in a few minutes. It provided money to banks. It made money easy and free um, for capital to obtain. And it stabilized the financial situation and it allowed financial subordination, subordinate financialization to continue. But fiscal policy, in other words, tax and spend, different story. There, for the last 10 years, most core governments have applied um, tightness of one type or another, austerity. Uh, and when you've got austerity, you're keeping demand down. If you're keeping demand down, you keep the supply down because capitalists have to find someone to sell to. And if demand is suppressed, then there is much of a demand for you to sell your commodities. Production also suffers. The outcome was then suppressed demand and public debt accumulation. Here is what happened um, in terms of fiscal expenditure. You can see 
that the state uh, during the great financial crisis had to expand its deficit, but it then rapidly contracted it. Rapid austerity, as you can see from the end of that um, uh, period. Um, and as it did that, public debt increased enormously. You can see the jump in public debt. These core countries then are not growing fast. Um, productivity is not increasing. The state is keeping fiscal expenditure down and it still increases its debt. It's a system that has come to depend on the state. However, that was as nothing compared to, happened, to what happened when the pandemic struck. In other words, Financialized, financialized capitalism at the core became clearly state-based throughout the last decade and much more so during the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, financialization was, a, uh, was at the watershed. Public debt was rising, corporate debt edged upwards, financial profits were in retreat and Capital flows to developed countries shrunk, but not to, develop, not, not to developing countries. In other words, subordinate financialization continued throughout the last decade, but flows among developed countries uh, weakened. That was the reality um, of what happened. I've got more evidence to show you, but I won't, because I've shown you enough graphs. I will move straight to the shock of 2020 now. What happened in 2020? The pandemic hit. The pandemic was an exogenous shock. Not endogenous, it didn't come from the dynamic of capitalist accumulation. The state imposed regulations and restrictions. The result of that was to cause a collapse of aggregate demand and a collapse of aggregate supply. Enterprises could not produce in the normal way. People could not consume in the normal way. The contraction was unprecedented, as I will show you in a minute. At that point, the state intervened again in core countries and adopted extraordinary monetary and fiscal policy. Nothing like that in the history of capitalism has been seen again. It is the, it is the trends that began after the great financial crisis, which I showed you in summary, intensified and much more so in fiscal policy. And in Europe, a real transformation has taken place. Um, as that happened, however, differential performance uh, was observed across the world, exacerbating imbalances, and capitalist accumulation has come to, to depend very heavily uh, uh, on the state. Let me give you a little bit of evidence to see what's happening. This is global growth from uh, 2019 to 2021. 20, uh, 20, <clears throat> you can see that global growth in 2019 was weak as I've indicated to you previously. This wasn't a system that was doing particularly well for the reasons that I explained. You can see the collapse that took place in the first and second quarter of 2020, as the state imposed restrictions across the world. Most of the collapse had to do with consumption collapse and investment collapse, uh, including, including in uh, developing countries. You can see the recovery in the third quarter and look at the orange looking, the orange color uh, component, that's China. Chinese investment is coming back faster than elsewhere. So that tells you that the state intervened but not all states are the same. That we can discuss uh, subsequently. So that was the shock and the response to the shock by the states, uh, nation states across the world. If for capital flows, here is the reality. Um, capital flows were to, to developing countries, including Eastern Europe. Um, you can see that for 2019 and 2020. These capital flows that I show you are basically portfolio flows, not FDI, because we don't have the figures for FDI. They're basically borrowing, borrowing um, and equity, buying shares, bonds and shares. You can see a steady flow in 2019. In other words, Subordinate financialization continues throughout that previous decade, but when the pandemic hits, you see a violent reversal. Exactly, exactly the way that I spelled it out for you previously. In other words, these flows are very short-term and you can get a sudden stop 
developing very, very quickly, which is what happened in the first um, few months of 2020. But then core states intervene. Monetary conditions change in core states. And there is a equally violent change of capital flows in the opposite direction, a recovery of flows. Um, portfolio considerations, that's basically, that's basically what you're looking at. What's interesting is that towards the end of 2020, these flows are also declining. Now, what does it mean more broadly and what does it mean for us in Europe? <laughs> Let's look at monetary policy and I'll tell you how the central bank is changing and how German hegemony is changing. <laughs> monetary policy is very important in this respect. I said at the beginning, subordinate financialization depends on global hierarchy of currencies and what happens to monetary policy in the core countries. The core countries adopted extraordinary monetary policy after 2007, 2009. The reason why they could do it is because of course, the state has monopoly of the, over the final means of payment in core countries, the US dollar, uh, fundamentally. And what we saw after 2008 was um, money creation backed by public asset acquisition and interest rates being driven down to zero. The state came to dominate the money market. This isn't free market capitalism in the financial system. It pretends to be. The state dominates it. It dominates the money market. It dominates the creation of uh, uh, fiat money and it controls the rate of interest. That process began in 2007, 2009. The pandemic crisis made it go through the roof and it transformed the way in which the European Central Bank operates. The transformation is most vivid and clear for the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank has begun to look like the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's an unprecedented development. If you asked me 10 years ago, would that happen? I would say no, uh, and yet it did. The reason why it did is of course, German hegemony. German hegemony it came to realize that, the, or the hegemonic power came to realize that the pandemic shock threatened the relations of domination in Europe. It threatened the monetary union and even the EU itself, and it had to give, and it gave, when it came to the uh, European Central Bank, which is the pivotal institution uh, of the monetary union and the pivotal institution of capital flows in Europe. Observe this, <laughs> the European Central Bank drives interest rates into negative territory uh, for a decade. Uh, much of this had to do with Draghi, but Lagarde continued um, the same process. How did they do this? It's clear. Purchase of public securities. Um, the blue line is of course, purchase of public securities by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve plays globally and therefore it has to intervene and engage in buying state assets to keep interest rates to zero across the world. But look at the ECB, look at the second um, line uh, in the histogram. These are ECB acquisitions. Who would have thought that the ECB would be acquiring um, state securities to, to quite that extent and transform itself, or rather the Euro system, transform itself into uh, a major holder of public securities uh, across Europe. Exactly the same thing can be seen in terms of the consolidated assets of the Euro system. Um, you can see that in the great financial crisis, it didn't really happen. They expanded the balance sheet, but not that much. You can see that Draghi began to increase it. Draghi is the person who consolidated transformation. And then you can see the huge jump um, with Lagarde when the pandemic hit. The European Central Bank now resembles the Federal Reserve. It's at the heart um, of, um, monetary transactions in Europe, and obviously it affects what happens in Eastern Europe in ways that I will point out in a minute. <laughs> that is, um, I kid you not, that is a transformation that is astonishing. And it tells you that behind the mechanisms of economic uh, 
interdependence and subordination, there is political decision making. This is a political decision, what you say. It's a political decision by the German, the German hegemon to accept it, to accept this policy uh, by the European Central Bank. The outcome is a narrowing of spreads. By doing that, the European Central Bank succeeded in narrowing the spreads dramatically. And you can see the difference between countries that are in the system and outside the system, Poland being the most obvious one, uh, in which spreads are not declining. The countries that are outside the EMU, but still in Eastern Europe, um, have to pay more for borrowing <coughs> compared to countries that are uh, in the EMU. Um, so um, monetary policy was changed in an extraordinary way. The European Central Bank was transformed, but fiscal policy was also changed in an uh, extraordinary way. Um, in core countries, who would have imagined that? The state intervened, unlike what it did after 2007, 2009. No austerity this time. Suspension of the um, Stability and Growth Pact. Huge amounts of public spending and opening up of deficits, not only through automatic stabilizers, in other words, automatically, but actively. The state intervening by partly nationalizing the income statement of corporations, paying, in other words, supporting them and making sure that they don't have losses. Partly nationalizing the wage bill, in other words, paying people's wages and giving income support President Trump sent checks through the post to working people in, in the United States. So huge boost to aggregate demand, but of course with great differences across the world. Most of that boost was focused primarily um, on uh, big business. The difference is um, clear to see in terms of expenditure. You can see that uh, advanced countries, have spent most of the, much more than emerging countries. So you can see the difference between central, the central periphery of Europe and core Europe. Um, advanced countries have spent much more support in their economies compared to um, uh, emerging countries. And of course, much more than, um, than poor countries. But of course, at the same time, um, public deficits have increased even more uh, in core countries, huge amounts of uh, public deficit. In Europe, what this has meant, the hidden heart of um, subordinate financialization and German hegemony in Europe, behind this, behind this transformation of the monetary system and the monetary expenditure and fiscal expenditure, expenditure is of course target two balances. The secret is here. If you look at target two balances, which are basically central bank transactions within the, um, monetary union, um, you can see the reality of it. For the last 10 years, the, the Bundesbank has maintained a huge surplus matched by uh, an equal deficit of Spain and Italy taken together. And look at the jump in the course of the pandemic. The expenditure that I mentioned, the tremendous growth of fiscal spending and monetary um, uh, uh, relaxation in Europe has basically meant that Germany is accumulating um, enormous amounts of claims on uh, other countries within the monetary union, 1.1 trillion at the moment. And that's the hidden, hidden heart of German domination. That's the hidden heart of subordinate financialization in Europe. That's basically the equivalent, that's basically the equivalent of the Bank of England managing the gold reserve in London in the, in, in the period of Pax Britannica. Pax Britannica was based on the gold hoard of the Bank of England and the way the Bank of England managed it. Well, Pax Germanica in Europe is based on this thing that you see here, which is basically um, uh, the Bundesbank tolerating enormous um, divergence of claims and liabilities because it must, because otherwise the monetary union will collapse and possibly the EU will collapse. That is behind the capital flows, uh, the way that uh, I pointed them out. I wanna finish this very broad ranging presentation by asking whether this is the end of neoliberalism and the end of financial, um, subordinate financialization. <clears throat> it's too soon to tell. 
a year ago, I believed that no, neoliberalism will is here to stay. And acts of spending were always acceptable within the neoliberal paradigm. We know that, I mean, public spending are always acceptable within the neo, neo, neoliberal paradigm when uh, danger is great. Monetary policy by itself, fiscal policy by itself are not a negation of neoliberalism. Um, other things have to happen for neoliberalism to, to be considered finished, a challenge to private property, um, a massive wave of public investment, um, and the transformation of labor rights compared to capital um, rights. We haven't seen that yet. That hasn't happened. The state has spent a lot of money uh, boosting aggregate demand, supporting aggregate demand. The state has made um, monetary policy very, very lax and money is free. But the state has been very careful so far not to threaten property rights and equity. It hasn't taken over uh, the equity of um, private enterprises. What we've seen so far is basically state-based financialization and state-based support for global capital flows, as I've uh, indicated um, before. Is that stable? Well, <laughs> it's, even more, it's even more unstable than it was three years ago. What will happen and how that will impact on um, subordinate financialization, how that will affect obviously Central and Eastern Europe, will depend uh, on what occurs in the, in the United States and obviously what occurs in uh, core Europe, but first in the United States, uh, and above all what happens there uh, um, impacting the role of the dollar as well currency, and that will depend on inflation. Uh, the debate about inflation that you've seen uh, in the press, the concern about inflation in the United States and elsewhere is precisely that. It's actually, it's actually shorthand for uh, the direction of hegemony and for the direction of financialization, because of course, the lenders fear inflation more than anything. If inflation picks up, then the state will be forced to take different policy compared to now. But if it is forced to raise interest rates, the crisis will be enormous because there'll be capital losses. The state might then be forced to intervene precisely in the sphere in which it hasn't been willing to intervene. That is on the side of supply, on the side of equity. The jury then is still out. But that this is a moment of uh, critical decision making for uh, global financial capitalism is cl it's clear, it's clear. Uh, we might be witnessing um, a point of inflection, uh, an accelerated shift away from um, financialization and neoliberalism. Um, we will know um, more uh, in the coming months, particularly by watching what's happening um, in the United States. Uh, when that happens, we might have the opportunity to discuss it again, and then we might have the opportunity to rely once again on what Polanyi wrote about um, 70 odd years ago, because that will become uh, even more obviously relevant to what the world will have to do uh, ahead. Anyway, thank you very much for your patience. I know it's been a long talk. Um, I hope it's been useful to you, and I look forward to questions. Um, Thank you very much, Kostas. Um, I will make three points. Um, one that comes from um, my background as a comparativist that challenges the economy. The second one that comes from my other hat as an um, international political economist. And the third one is um, just pushing you a little bit more on the theme of the conference, which is Polanyi and the Great Transformation. And you have charted towards the end um, the contours, um, hesitantly, the contours of perhaps uh, a great transformation emerging from the pandemic economics. So on the first point, um, as a, as a um, comparative political economist, um, I was very interested in your remarks about um, um, neoliberalism as the ideology of this, um, of this financialized system that you're referring to. Um, and um, even more so in the case of the subordinate variety of this financialization that characterizes uh, peripheries such as um, such as ours. Um, 
Um, and also, uh, you made the remark about um, about not just about the ideology, but also about um, arbitrage um, as one of the sort of materialist mechanisms for um, extracting value. Now, um, my question to you is: um, How should we understand the ruptures in the logic of subordinate um, financialization? Um, and I'll give you one specific example here. Um, if indeed, um, if indeed, in the currency hierarchy and in the subordinate fin financialization in general, um, there is a um, utter lack of um, of autonomy of policy autonomy, then how do we understand uh, such massive definancialization processes that we have seen, for for instance, in the case of, of Hungary since 2010? where across several of the key variables of financialization, we have seen a reversal. We have even seen a re-Hungarianization um, of the property rights over, um, over finance, with many international banks becoming, um, becoming um, sort of um, either um, uh, state-owned very briefly, but mostly in the hands of, of domestic capitalists. So what's interesting in this story um, is that um, it can be understood, and, and I'm, I'm just curious what you think of this hypothesis. It can be understood as part of this narrative that you have uh, presented, that it is yet another arbitrage niche, right? In the sense that um, um, Hungary is a risky country with the highest debt in the, in the region, uh, very high, highest levels of, of foreign ownership, became too risky for um, uh, portfolio investors. And even though it engaged in extremely uh, unconventional acts of financial repression, uh, a la post-war period uh, in some cases, it has actually stabilized um, in a very orthodox way, the fiscal situation of the state. This, it, it has gone from a country with deficits to a country with surpluses. Investors just love this thing, right? Rather than freak out at definancialization, they kept lending to the to the government. They kept pouring money into Hungary. Um, so it seems to me that you, he, even in a periphery with a very weak currency, such as um, and I'm just giving you you here Hungary as an example. I'm sure we can think of others. There may be a bit more space for for autonomy than the most uh, the more um, skeptical uh, account that you have uh, alluded to. Um, Perhaps we could think that you know uh, Orban got lucky, and this was the age of high risk in the core, and capital was going in the periphery in 2010-15. Um, but the situation continued even even after that, right? And now, of course, uh, everybody celebrates the fact that central banks um, are monetizing that, and and they're, they're doing all these things that they're not supposed to do, uh, while at the time. Um, there was a lot of concern uh, that Hungary will go bankrupt if they monetize that. They will go, uh, nobody is going to lend to them if they definancialize. And yet they've done precisely that. Now, that's a, so the first, my, my first point is that when we think of subordinate financialization, we should think of, um, of the varieties within it, right? And I, I'm not sure how long this will continue in the, in the, in the, in the case of Hungary. We're seeing certainly elements of that, of that in the case of Poland. And, and as your graphs show, um, Poland is doing quite well when it comes to its um, um, defenses um, against the arbitrageurs that you have uh, pointed to, right? So that's the first comment. It comes from my kind of obsession, always like teasing out um, um, sort of um, regimes of vulnerability uh, that countries that are part of subordinate financialization are part of. The second, uh, the second comment um, that I'm asking for comes from my uh, identity as an international political economist, and I, I, I found your remarks about um, re remarks about the core periphery relationship and the importance of the Fed and American power uh, in, in, in general. Absolutely fascinating and convincing. Um, and um, the, the only thing I would add, and I, I'm sure I'm sure that we are um, uh, sort of have our ducks lined up uh, in this regard, is the importance of of swaps, right? And the fact that yes, you know, um, you know, the ECB is more is more like the has become more like the Fed, but the ECB is subordinated to the Fed to the swap system. If you look at the at the just immense um, 
amounts of, um, uh, of swaps in the depth of the pandemic in March, April last year, they were on the same, same magnitude as in the, uh, in the Great um, Recession. So in that sense, um, we have not moved away from, um, of, or away from European dependence on the American um, central bank um, and the financial sector. We, we are very much like in uh, Polanyi's 1920s when he was writing in Vienna about dependence on American finance. We're still there. We haven't moved away from that. Contrary to proclamations of the, about the decay of American power, here we are, you know, the largest market in the world um, still depending, you know, holding our breath whether the swaps will be renewed, right, in the next crisis. And uh, yet another iteration of the vulnerability C point too. So I, I would like to, to hear your views a little bit on the significance of, of two things, right? The fact that the Fed uh, acted as this kind of like stabilizer and, and um, of last resort and lender to the world and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And, you know, and uh, as an actor that extended a lot of countries eligible for swaps holding Europe on a tight leash in this regard, with the, during the, the Trump administration, with the arrival of the, of the Biden administration, because I personally am struggling with what to call the system that's emerging now, right, uh, after Biden. So what, am I see, what are we seeing? We're seeing a blurry, a blurred line between monetary and fiscal policy, right? Uh, I, must, I would not have called this a few years ago. We're seeing that in Europe, we're seeing it in the UK, we're seeing it in the US. In Japan, it was there forever. Um, we're seeing calls for minimum corporate taxation, right? Which kind of touches the, the property rights as described by capital for a very long time. Um, we're seeing, and to me, this is absolutely fascinating and I agree with you, right? When the conversation changes about inflation, then we are talking about, about change. And I think that the definition of inflation in the Biden economic team as originating not in fiscal policy expansion, but in, um, in exogenous price shocks in global value chains is a complete game changer, right? The entire monetarist edifice collapses. We can no longer use neoliberal arguments to prop up a certain uh, set of class interests that, you, you, that, that are camouflaged in this, in this financialization regime. No, the American power comes and says, we don't buy all of that. It's 40 years of, of neoliberal, monet, uh, neoliberal views of the relationship between public spending and inflation we don't buy that. That has changed. We are we live in a different economy, and therefore we are not afraid of inflation. They 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 go for a game of chicken with with the markets on this, perhaps. And, and I'm I'm curious what you think. Why that is the case? How do we what do how do we make sense of this of these um, ruptures um, in the case of the of the Biden administration? Um, because the intellectual, the very intellectual legitimation of monetary policy as the linchpin of the entire system that you're describing is gone, right? Um, some people called it the new empiricism, et cetera, right? I mean, I don't want to get in, into that. Um, but I'm curious what you think of, about the significance of that and the significance that it has on the periphery. Because this system is going to suck capital back to the American mothership, right? If they're right about it. Um, and in a sense, um, basically, um, it can be the quick fix to the profit crisis that you mentioned, um, or it could be just an endogenous American story that comes from the kind of Polanyan counter movements, progressive and regressive at the same time, that have battered the American, um, um, the American uh, political sphere in the last in the last decade. Okay, so the first question about, was about variation within subordinate financialization. The second was about you know, how do we read the Biden moment combined with the Fed moment, right? Because we're seeing massive transformations in the mandate uh, of the Fed. And then the third one on the great transformation um, represented by, by pandemic economics. And I, I, I think your, your uh, graph on target two and, and German claims is absolutely essential to understanding what the core of the story is, okay? So in a sense, just like, Maybe there is a correspondence between the German hegemony story and the American hegemony story here, because what, what both of them do, they act as stabilizers of the system over which they have a mandate, right? So Germany acts as a stabilizer of the EU system over which it has you know, a mandate of stabilization and, uh, and the Americans act as, as stabilizers of the global financial system that um, is um, um, anchored in Wall Street and the Fed. So here, 
in this Pax Germanica, I want to hear a little bit more about that because it concerns us directly, right? Um, the, the great transformation of East Central Europe, if I were to boil it down to a, a single thing, would be its integration into German value chains. This is what it is, right? It's German lead firms are our economy. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, I mean, in, in some cases, case, cases it's quite extreme, but everybody's affected by this, right? I mean, it's, if you want to understand the direction of growth, employment, wages in Romania or Slovakia, um, you have to look at uh, the, the, what kind of positions German lead firms have here, right? And then from then on, it's all about the German surplus, right? So in this past Germanica, what's interesting is that you, you couldn't decide between what are we seeing here? Is it an economic emergency state that's ruled by Pax Germanica? Or are we seeing the emergence of a new regime and the, and the great transformation? And I agree with you. I think it's too early to, uh, to call it, right? I think so far we have the evidence that it is an economic emergency state. The, the ECB is monetizing a, a public debt left and right. Um, you know, we are seeing um, a defeat of some of the, of the um, uh, sacred uh, uh, myths of, um, of European integration when it comes to fiscal um, rigor. But what we see here um, in, the, in, in, our, in our case in the periphery is that in the East European region, um, that really hasn't happened. I mean, uh, if you look at the share of, um, of public spending per GDP, uh, um, that was dedicated to rescue measures, nobody's above the EU average here, right? So yes, you're correct to point out that in a sense, the East Central European region gets a better deal out of Pax Germanica than the Southern European periphery. Sure, right? But then, no matter whether they're Eurozone member states or non-Eurozone member states, they have all had extremely um, pallid um, reluctant responses uh, in terms of the support systems that were generated. So if indeed, maybe there's an economic emergency state in the core, we're not seeing that here very much, uh, to be frank. So, so maybe that, that requires some thinking about core periphery within Europe, even when it comes to the more privileged periphery that we are compared to the Southern periphery. Um, so I don't want to exceed the, the, the limits of time here, but I'm just, very intrigued by this particular uh, last point because this is about Polanyi and the great transformation um, and it seems like this emerging perhaps transition from the economic emergency state of Pax Germanica to something that no longer resembles the, the neoliberalism from before the pandemic right with some people saying oh these measures will become permanent you know um, near zero rates monetization maybe like really harsh interventions on, on taxation etc um, but it seems like um, the, 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 the version of the growth regime that we have here uh, seems to be very constrained by the possibilities of, of even the economic emergency state. So maybe, maybe these things um, spread out in, in more, in more um, uh, graduated ways um, than uh, we would otherwise think, right? So um, to conclude, yeah, to me, the biggest, the, my biggest, um, uh, interest in your talk came from your reflection on, um, on, 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 on thinking about um, what kind of uh, growth regime is emerging out of the um, intersection of an endogenous crisis, the Great Recession, and an exogenous crisis, the pandemic. And what came from that is a hesitation to call what's going on. Yeah? It is like you said, neoliberalism allows for, um, for a state of exception, right? We may be still in a state of exception. And then when this is over, we're going to go back to mastery and go back to the straight jacket and, and go back to you know, cutting that and, and supply side measures. I personally think that we won't be going back there. Um, and the reason for that is that the American state is in crisis and the, the American state is sending completely different sources of legitimacy um, than it used to for the last 40 years. And at the end of the day, um, it's not just about our central, East Central European region being dependent on Pax Germanica, but Pax Germanica depends on Pax Americana at the end of the day because of the hierarchies that you laid out. So I'm going to end here. Thank you. Shall I respond to that? Or, what's, or shall we wait? So 
I think I think you should answer, uh, but you should also take uh, you should also think about the other questions because we have two or three more questions in the in the chat box. So I first, just, I think you should answer to Cornell. Uh, yeah, if I could take those questions and then maybe you can give me an order for the chat questions. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the other people will want to ask questions as we move on. Um, <clears throat> Now, obviously, I wouldn't expect any, um, um, I would expect difficult points from Cornell, obviously. Uh, I wouldn't expect any favors when it comes to questions. Um, these go to, um, uh, what he raised goes to the heart of things and gives me the opportunity to um, add more to um, argue because what I argued was very broad. Um, so, the first point about subordinate financialization and varieties thereof. It's indisputable. Subordinate financialization, all financialization has got elements of variety within it. Subordinate financialization has got more variety necessarily because to a large extent it's actually endogenous, comes from the outside. It comes from the, it comes from the integration or association with global financial flows, um, foreign bank entry and uh, policies emanating from abroad. It doesn't, it comes less from within the process of domestic accumulation than it does, uh, than, than, than regular financialization, core financialization does. And therefore you'd expect more variety depending on the characteristics of the state, the, the, the national state and the characteristics of the national um, economy. Um, as a result, yes, you would expect uh, a range of um, policy options, but very narrow, right? There is no question that states can do things, in emerging market states or developing country states can do things. Um, and that has always been a question for the Minister of Finance, um, how to deal with foreign capital flows. Have always, they've always been able to do it. Malaysia, for instance, which is not in Eastern Europe, as we know, has been able to impose um, capital controls uh, from the time of the great financial cycle, great financial crisis, uh, other countries have imposed um, different um, uh, restrictions in how bond markets uh, affect them. And I mean, the fundamental thing is is capital controls, one one type or another. And even the IMF came out and said that this is a good idea. But why is it happening? Because there is no change in the architecture. Fundamentally, you shift the onus onto the developing country, onto the recipient, and basically you tell the recipient, you've got to manage as best you can. You've got a little bit of play, but it isn't very much, right? So you, you, can, you can operate more than other countries can do, and it depends on your own political economy, your domestic ideologies, your domestic state, and so on. But let's not uh, kid ourselves in terms of um, the range of options um, uh, 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 open here. Um, what matters in Hungary as well, and I'll come to it in a minute, it seems to me, not that I'm an expert on the Hungarian economy or anything like that, is of course FDI and, and foreign uh, productive capital flows as well. Um, and they have to do with German capital, which I mentioned um, in, in the talk. And that we need to look at more closely when I come to the last point um, you raised. So the first point is straightforward, yes. Domestic financial, uh, subordinate financialization is great, great variety. Turkish subordinate financialization is not the same thing as Kenyan subordinate financialization, not the same thing as uh, Argentine subordinate financialization or, or, or Korean, right? Because different structures of big business and the state um, in each of these countries, different way of accessing uh, uh, foreign capital. The biggest outlier, and then have time to discuss it here, is of course China, which is not a case of subordinate financialization because it's not formally open. It's not subject to capital coming in. It's actually a supplier of capital now in the last um, 10 years. It controls uh, flows, the state controls flows. It controls the banks, the state owns the banks and it controls big business. And yet it financializes uh, after fashion. So, Yes, you do have a great variety and one must bear, must bear it in mind, for sure. And in the Hungarian case, you've got to be aware uh, of the limits that 
the domestic um, government can pose on these things, which also holds for Poland, incidentally. Poland is similarly, um, and the Czech Republic. It helps in this case that none of these countries is in the euro. It helps considerably. Um, which takes me to the Fed and swaps. We'll get into the meat of it in a minute. Hierarchies of crucial importance, of course. And there is a currency hierarchy, naturally. The dollar is the pivot of the system and the dollar is behind global financialization. Without the dollar, global financialization would make sense. And of course, US monetary policy is the main um, driver of uh, global capital flows and therefore financialization uh, after that. It's true that the ECB received a um, great volume of swaps from the Fed. We don't know exactly what, was, what happened there. Why? Uh, most probably banks, European banks that were um, open, they had dollar liabilities and therefore they needed someone to provide them with dollar liquidity, um, which is what happened in 2007, 2009. We understand better what happened then because US, uh, because European banks, German and French banks were, were very heavily exposed to the US uh, bubble and therefore they sucked in the ECB which needed swaps at the time. Quite what happened in the pandemic shock, we don't know yet. It hasn't come out yet. We don't know why the swaps were um, so heavily required, but they were required. And therefore, what we saw was the reassertion of overall hegemony. Of course, the, 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 the US is, is hegemonic over Europe as well. And that is a very, very important point to which you've alluded. And that conditions Pax Germanica. I said that Germany is, a, is, a, is, a, is the hegemon of Europe, but let's not get carried away, right? It's hegemony is conditioned by the contest with France which of course is, is not in the same league economically, but it, can, it challenges it politically. And of course, German hegemony in Europe is conditioned by overall, overall American hegemony, uh, which is military of course in Europe, but it's also financial, right? Because uh, the dollar is the final means of payment. The Euro is not that. And uh, European financial institutions are still exposed to dollars and dollars cannot be created by the ECB. What does this mean? once we've understood a uh, situation like that. It means this, and that's a fundamental difference to uh, my understanding of that. US hegemony in the post-war post, um, war world emanated from economic primacy. In 1945, um, the United States economy was enormous compared to the rest of the world, and it held the largest reserves of gold and dominated production. Uh, and trade. Therefore, the United States uh, elite created the institutions through which its global uh, hegemony would manifest itself. And it created the financial institutions that allowed it to dominate the world in the 50s and 60s and much of the 70s. When these institutions broke with the end of Bretton Woods, the United States in a thousand indirect ways reshaped the World Bank and the IMF to give different content to its hegemony according to its interests in the new uh, conditions. Germany was never like that. It's the opposite in the case of Germany. German hegemony in Europe is the outcome of institutions created jointly with others. Germany did not create the European Union and it did not create the European Monetary Union because it suited its interests. These institutions were created in the way in which they were created. I don't want to go into that um, in the 50s, the 60s, 70s and so on. France played an arguably more important role even in the creation of the Monetary Union. The beneficiary was Germany. It's the biggest historical miscalculation in Europe since Napoleon invaded Russia, in this case. The, the, the French created the monetary union because they thought that they would control Germany. And they ended up with the German domination of uh, um, economic affairs. So German, German um, hegemony is conditional 
condition of the institutions of the European Union. The German elite knows that. It knows that without the EU and without particularly the European Monetary Union, it's not particularly hegemonic over anything. Its economy is not big enough. Its presence globally is not big enough. As hegemon over the EU, it can play globally. This means that it must defend. It must defend the EU and it must defend the monetary union. That is very well understood by the top, the, the, the top of the German ruling uh, bloc at the moment, which is mostly industrial and less so bank related and financial. They understand that. And that's why they backed off. That's why they backed off when it came to uh, uh, what the ECB has been doing and did in spades in the last year. And that's why they backed off on fiscal policy. Um, so, and that's the difference with Germany, with the US, which is the overarching hegemon in this case. Uh, Kostas, we, I think we should also open the, uh, the floor to the questions and also maybe continue the conversation with Cornel uh, at the end. I cannot hear you. Can you, do you want me to take this, do you want to order the questions yourself? Veronica, do you um, want me to take? I think, I, I, I suggest that the people who ask the question, read them aloud if they can, and if they are there, if not, I can, I can read them. So maybe Nicolas Levis first, if you are here. Thank mm. you. Uh, I'm coming. Yes. yes, here I am. There I am. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. 